Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Quincy Koziol. I'm in the DAS group as well. And I'm going to give you a high level, about 20 minute uh, overview of IO best practices for your applications on NERSC systems, but in general, in HPT. So, we're going to cover um, the basics of parallel IO, um, walk through the stack, talk a little bit about the profiling tools you have available to you. At, uh, at NERSC and other places. Talk a little bit about, well, okay, uh, everything's going slow and I can use Starshine, but what does that mean? What am, I, what am I doing wrong? Talk a little bit about the IO libraries available that uh, should be able to help you out. And then talk a little bit further about the diverse buffer architecture and how to use it productively at NERSC. So from a very high level perspective, um, your application is, is wanting to store data somewhere in the, on the file system. So we're, you're going to say, hey, go read my data. Uh, and hopefully it's not CSV. Data. But um, what actually happens underneath that on the way out to the file system is quite a stack of software. So below that, typically, um, You've got some productivity interface that's typically a um, interpreted language, typically Python, as we're showing here, that uh, gives you some easy to write, easy to read, hopefully easy to debug um, interface into uh, the file system for your application. Below that, there's usually a layer inside Python that uh, calls into a high level IO library, a little bit lower level middleware. And then we get down into system software. So the productivity interface is probably what you're going to call into from your application, especially if it's Python. Um, very thin layer, designed to just kind of stitch things together for you and get out of the way. So typically a Python, TensorFlow, Spark kind of layer that you're going to call into. That layer typically goes into one of the high-level I.O. libraries that's available, HDF5, PNCDF, perhaps Adios or Root. Um, something that provides a abstraction layer over the lower levels of MPI or the parallel file system. It gives you a more object-oriented perspective than the bytes that are on the disk. IO middleware is very, that's where we transition into bytes effectively, um, but it gives us uh, the leverage for knowing still that there's a lot of processes running as a parallel job, um, and it may perform what we call collective I.O., which I'll talk about a little later. Um, MPI, PLFS, Clean, these sorts of um, packages are what's typically used at this level to kind of bring everything together in a coherent way. Below that, okay, now we're leaving your node going into the file system somewhere. Uh, so we're forwarding the I.O. from a lot of your client compute nodes, aggregating it into larger requests, and this helps to reduce the lock contention in the file system and um, may cross over outside of the system. Some modern systems are moving storage internally into actual nodes in the HPC system, but most of the time you're, you're transitioning off into a storage box somewhere outside the, the compute system. Things like data work or IOFSL, these sort of packages that you'll see in that next. Parallel file systems like Luster that, and GPFS that uh, Jolyn is talking about, they, they provide kind of a POSIX looking interface to a file system, but are designed for very large, very concurrent workloads that are coordinated, not loosely coupled, everybody writing randomly, but generally some pattern of, of coherence that uh, is imposed by the I.O. or perhaps even the HDF5 layer. And then below that, we get into the I.O. hardware that I won't touch on here, but you know, disks and, and DRAM uh, drives and things like that. So you're going to write, typically, we hope, um, a very high level Python code, um, something like this, perhaps. This is using H5Pi, which is up way up at the productivity layer. So it's Python code that imports the right modules for MPI and HDF5. Um, does something simple to open the file and then uses the niceties of Python's um, array access slices to 
to uh, read data in from disk or write data out to disk, whichever is going on. And there's good ways to set up collective I.O. even up at the high level so you can maximize your performance here on the system. <coughs> So when you look at this, there's approximately 35 lines on the left side. That's an entire Python program. On the right side is C uh, with an HTF5, similar set of I.O. patterns. But you can see we've got about 35 lines on, the, on this side, but we're like halfway through the coding effort, something like that. This uh, shows you kind of the conciseness of Python and other languages uh, that are a little less verbose than the C. So this whole program in HDF5 is going to get reduced down to some chunks here inside the Python code. I'll show you the mapping here. So um, opening the file is a piece that covers this first 35 lines of the screen. All those include files and all the way down to that you try that create down on line 30, 31. Um, all that boils down into about 10 lines of Python code. Then the next section of the HDF5 code is another 30 lines of code, and this is setting up to go write a data set, um, a collective one. You can see how that shrinks down quite a bit. And then finally, the last section of HDF5's uh, clean up everything and close it all down really isn't even necessary for Python. It does all that passively in the background for you. So it's a really short chunk of code that says, hey, yeah, close the file. So you can see the, the coding effort and the time spent figuring out how to get your I.O. is much, much easier for the Python uh, world than the C world. You get a little bit more expressivity. There might be a feature that isn't covered in the Python layer, but typically the HIPI pi and other wrappers on top of HDF5 and PNCDF, they do a very good job of expressing the features and still giving uh, the power up at the Python uh, part. So, but, okay, fine, I improved my productivity, how much performance are you losing? This is a ratio of performance against uh, C code. So you can see that typically for independent and collective I.O., you're really close with Python to what uh, the speed is of a C program. When you do things that are very, um, I would say granular, you know, very small operations of metadata, um, it's going to perform somewhat worse. It's got a lot more layers to pass through and interpret in order to get down to the actual go open this file or create this file um, and walk along individual components of the file is slow or slower and terrible. Um, but when you actually do the actual I.O., the, the at scale, write these data set elements out, um, very comparable almost full speed in most cases. So hopefully that, that encourages you to, to try Python at least if you aren't already. And, and when you do, you can pretty much expect the uh, I.O. performance to not be your bottleneck. So stepping down the stack one more level below productivity layers, uh, we get into HTF5 or another high level I.O. libraries. Um, and these Take advantage of Parallel I.O. They do a bunch of work for you to um, eliminate that from your application. So even though it's a little verbose to write the C code, it's a lot less verbose than writing the raw C code to talk to MPI or something. So they add uh, a very nice, well-defined layer, an entire ecosystem that you can subscribe to and participate in for HDF5. All the applications that um, can read and write HDF5 code can now access your code uh, if you use it. Um, it has a lot of expressivity. Nobody has a question? No. Uh, All the slides. Oh, sorry. Okay. Shannon, interrupt me if there's something I need to speak to. Okay. And I will just ignore the. Uh, Okay, so um, yes, all these layers, uh, high level IO libraries, the HDF5, NetCDF, Adios, they all are very machine independent, self describing, focused on science data. Uh, these are not uh, CSV files for Excel or text or anything like that. These are very, very compact, high efficiency um, files that you're producing with 
hybrid one. They've all been around for a while, and that's terribly important, but uh, we have a lot of experience dealing with parallel file systems uh, in all these packages. So when you program, if you were writing in C uh, for HTF5, uh, this is a very, very simplified uh, serial code. It shows basically that you can create these property lists, HIP call, you open a file, you set up the arrayness for your data set, create it, and write to it. Still, even in C, it's not terribly verbose. In parallel, you have to add in a little bit of extra complexity, but it's not terrible. Um, and hopefully, the MPI and NIT and finalize are not part of your I.O. Uh, pipeline. That, that would be very simple. So the actual calls here for doing parallel I.O. for HTF5 is you, you want to say, hey, I, I need to use the MPI driver. Um, you set that up as part of your property list when you open the file. Then later on, after you've created the data set, you want to do a collective I.O. operation in many cases, not always, but many. Um, so you have to tell HTF5, by the way, go ahead and use collective um, writing for this data set, um, and you create a data set transfer property list, tell the property list that anytime you use this property list, it's going to be a collective I.O., um, and then you go wrap your data. So it's kind of a layer on top of the serial, a few extra lines of code, but you get the, the full power of the parallel file system. So proceeding down the stack again, what's below HDF5? Typically MPI. Um, some of the other projects that I mentioned earlier, they're largely research um, packages and in production systems today, you're going to be dealing with MPI. Um, is, provides another layer of performance over the raw file system um, and hopefully has done a lot of the optimizations for you that you would otherwise need to be doing to aggregate together and then do I.O. in sufficient ways rather than byte by byte. So MPI is a byte oriented interface, um, very much like POSIX, and you specify what offsets you're going to write to and then you do I.O. to those. In HDF5, builds on top of the PIO and, and provides that object abstraction layer on top of the POSIX byte stream. So MPI, typically when we talk about MPI, the most important thing that people think about is the collective I.O. component, and we'll talk about that in another couple of slides. But it also has interesting ways to efficiently describe non-contiguous I.O. with its data types and file views. It provides some amounts of non-blocking or does asynchronous I.O. Um, not completely asynchronous in the fact that they may not execute in the background completely detached. And you may need to, uh, be, they may only make progress when MPI is in the, in being called. Uh, they do provide Fortran in other languages. We, said we saw one for Python. And they provide a very basic way of, of providing a portable file format. It's basically a, a byte swizzling to get everything into uh, big Indian format, which these days turns out to be a mistake. But back in the early 2000s, it looked like Sun was a really good thing. Big Indian was the right thing to do. So, a little bit about collective and independent I.O. Uh, this chaotic arrow diagram here is, is a, a good representation for independent I.O. Every process is doing its own thing. Nobody's trying to coordinate with anyone else doing the writes to the file system, and everybody is just writing wherever. Uh, they don't talk to each other. They don't have to talk to each other, which is good in some way. Uh, but they don't get any benefit from the effects if they could talk to each other. And you do want to use independent I.O. sometimes. If it's very small bits of metadata that you're writing out to your disk, you know, how many, what's the actual size of your array or something, some header that you're appending in the file, maybe independent is the right thing to do. And sometimes the synchronization doesn't match your file. We get this sometimes with um, adaptive mesh codes where things are out of balance or, or uh, variable sized on different ranks. But typically, the, the best performance is gained when you find the right places to use collective I.O. in your application. Basically, it means that every 
process in your MPI program. Uh, we're writing to HDF5 the same way I showed that earlier. Um, all the processes call that I.O. operation and let that I.O. operation know that it's a collective operation. What that means to the layer below you, to HDF5 or FBI, is that you are free to communicate with all the other ranks because you know they're all here. And then you can look at the I.O. pattern, the, the underlying layer, HDF5 or MPI, looks at the I.O. underlying I.O. pattern, that it gets all the information from the other ranks and can optimize for you. It's, oh, we have six ranks in this job and everybody is writing every sixth element in a strided pattern across the array. I will stitch those all together into big, nice, buffered writes to the file system so you don't get extremely tiny writes from each process. This is typically the, the best way for you know, your best performance as an application. So it work in all cases, and you have to guarantee that all the processes are there. But typically, this is where you're going to max out your, your IOs. So with that in mind, maxing out your IO performance is your goal. You need to be giving some thought to how do I analyze this? How am I thinking about what is my IO pattern? Um, you know, you have a number of questions that you need to ask yourself. Well, am I writing from every process or just a subset? How many files am I writing? How big is the I.O. to the file? Am I writing every time step, every hundred time steps? What are the buffer sizes? All these questions, right? And you think about these aspects of your I.O. pattern. And especially in a parallel world, um, contiguous and non-contiguous I.O. patterns into a buffer and sequential and random um, patterns are also very important. The parallel file systems that we have today for the future are uh, very dependent on large sequential writes. If you hit them with lots of random I.O., especially very small random I.O., you will get extremely poor performance. Very so just as an example, if you um, have a contiguous I.O. pattern on your disk, then your, your read times are going to be reading consecutive um, sectors or blocks off the file system, off the disk, and boom, 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 your read time's right up. When it's non-contiguous, you have to see, the disk has to rotate, you're actually reading something for your block, um, and your total time to do that series of IOs is going to be an order of magnitude or worse. It's just terrible. So do what you can to make things contiguous in nice uh, sequential patterns. HDF5 does that for you when you use collectives and the PI. So those are good helpers in your applications. Uh, performance goals. So you say to yourself, well, that's all fine, but how do I know how much time IO actually is occurring here? So NERSC provides a module called Darshan which is an I.O. profiling tool. It profiles uh, MPI, POSIX, and HDF5. Uh, Argon folks have developed this and they've been maintaining it for a long time. It's done a great job. And when you load that module, it's by default, you can unload it if you want, which you probably don't want to do. But when you load that module, when it's loaded in your environment, the log files are uh, produced in these locations on the file system, Cori Scratch and the Darshan logs. And there's a lot of log files in there. You should find yours using your username and your job to get out to the actual name of your uh, Darshan log file. And you can look in there and say, hey, what's going on? These are huge log files. So you probably want to use some of the Darshan commands, these Perl scripts and um, shell scripts, to actually like produce summaries uh, of, of the entire log or per file. And that should give you a much better idea of, well, am I doing not a little I.O.? Is it being efficient? Am I doing actual collective I.O. with MPI? These kinds of things. And as a sort of success story in this regard, um, Jalen principally, I helped some, um, did a lot of work with the Athena uh, application code, the astrophysics code, uses, used a lot of um, astronomy and cosmology codes. Um, you can see on the left side how the I.O. Um, was these green bars, right? We're, we're taking uh, 
40% of the application's time to do I.O. It's terrible. So running that through Darshan and then looking at the summary output in Darshan, you know, oh, it's terrible, what's going on? Get in there and adjust Athena's I.O. behavior so that it avoids some of the pitfalls that it was otherwise doing and then was able to leverage the collective I.O. correctly. And now it basically goes to zero. Everything that was taking I.O. before is completely unmeasurable in, uh, in the application run. So this saves them millions of compute hours per year, right? Could be an extremely uh, important benefit if your I.O. is, is taking a, a good chunk of your, uh, your run time. So, uh, let's see. Talk a little bit about um, component of the file system here for the Cori system, which is this burst buffer. It's no longer any disk drives that we're dealing with, but rather a, you know, an array of NVRAMs on state disks. Um, complicated diagram, but basically this is showing that your compute nodes are connected to the burst buffer, still sitting with the burst buffer on the high-speed network for Cori. Um, and then that can transfer from the burst buffer through the I.O. nodes back into the Lustre file system, kind of as a staging things in and staging things out from the burst buffer. You can tell over here on the table on the right that the burst buffer is much smaller than the Lustre file system at scratch um, by a factor of 15 or so. So it's only about two petabytes. But it uh, does give an enormous uh, performance boost over the, over the scratch system. Uh, yes. So the other nice aspect of the burst buffer was that this provides a POSIX file system. So it looks normal. You're not sealing like all these collections of buffers in the in VRAM drive somewhere. It looks like a POSIX file system. So what happens when you do access to the burst buffer from your compute node? What exactly is going to go on? So when you want to use the burst buffer, you submit your job and you tell uh, Slurm, you know, by the way, I need this much capacity. Please stage these files in before the job starts. And then when I'm done now, my output files are named this, this, and this, and stage those out after my compute phase is done. That all happens kind of outside your control. I mean, it's in your Slurm job script, but Slurm uh, scheduler will take care of that for you. And then when the app is um, ready to schedule, it creates that parallel file system on the burst buffer nodes, and it preloads all the files that you wanted in from the scratch uh, file system. Then your app accesses those things directly using HTML5 MPI, all that works just fine. And then, of course, when your app completes, we stage out the data from the uh, data work file system from the first buffer back out to the scratch system. So very straightforward, pretty um, obvious in a sense, but um, with that additional bit of effort to stage your, node, your data in from scratch into the first buffers, you can tell from this next slide that there is a significant performance improvement. We went from, uh, with one application, H5 Boss, which is doing analysis of astronomy images, um, bring them in to the first buffer from Luster was a 30% improvement um, in some cases, and in some cases, four, not 30%, 30 times, um, and in other, you know, from the FITS files, uh, it was basically a four times improvement. FITS is still slow. Um, you can see here, in the first buffer, it still takes 40 seconds to read the FITS file. Uh, but still, huge improvement for your app's performance time. If you can restage your data into the first buffer as part of your job, um, your I.O. time should go way down. Uh, that's a very important aspect of doing this. It probably negates some of the real magnitude benefits of doing collective I.O. If you can just get it into the burst buffer and then even independent I.O. is probably pretty reasonable in the case. So that's, that's all I got. Kevin, any 
questions or comments or phones? Yeah, any questions? Any questions? I see. Is there any right way to operate on not so small files? Just doing an RM scratch directory of 10,000 files it took a long time to complete. You can only imagine how much time was lost reading and writing the files. The answer. Um, um, you're maybe doing asking two questions here, and if you want to unmute and chat, that's great. Um, the on the one hand, you're talking about file system operations, doing the RM on the thousand, ten thousand files, um, is a POSIX operation at the file system level. Um, and I cannot think of any ideally much better ways, aside from don't make that many small files, um, to improve your access to the uh, directory IO on, on a scratch partition. Um, that, I guess, is one of the fundamental lessons of I.O. is make bigger buffers. Uh, important part. Does that help? 